The views and opinions of the hosts and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the management and staff of Guardian Network. In fact, good yawning this morning. I'm so glad that this cold front is trying to hold on for one more day. I don't know if my BPL bill could take it. Um, I don't know if any of us could take it. I don't know if the fans in my house could take it. they still on strike from last summer. But you're on the clock, and today is Thursday, March the 25th, 2021. On the clock, we engage organizations, institutions, social and cultural leaders, and ordinary people to better understand the impact of public policy, private sector development, and emerging social and consumer trends. My guest host today is Mr. Darwin Thompson. He's a human rights advocate. And my guest today is Reverend Kelly Jolly. And she works in the Bahamas, Turks, and Caicos Conference of the Methodist Church of the Caribbean and the Americas. Um, and when I started putting the show together, I wanted to remind us of our duty of care to children and young people, particularly those in close proximity to us. Because I feel like we collectively disregard the stress and uncertainty and disruption that they are experiencing. And we disregard what is required of us to help traverse, help them traverse and navigate this uncertainty as easily as possible. And I think that's most obvious in the education system where we still haven't figured out how to center the student in the process of learning. Well, while I was prepping my notes, I found this voice note on my WhatsApps, as you do, right, when you're just minding your own business. And uh, I listened to a gentleman, Mr. Kent Bazard, recount how he witnessed a young girl in a potentially dangerous situation, and he took the time to assess and then act to protect her, along with a number of other people on the scene. So while we acknowledge that violence against women and girls continues unabated, we must also acknowledge that men and women continue to work in various ways to eradicate violence and create safe spaces for children and young and vulnerable people. And I think I have Mr. Bazard on the line with us right now. Oh, awesome. Good morning, Mr. Bazard. How are you? Hi, morning. Good. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Let me apologize. Let me call you by your name. Dr. Bazard. <laughs> yeah, same person. How you doing, man? I'm good, thank you. But first of all, let me give you a proper welcome. Bup, bup, bup. Blessings to you, my brethren. Big up and thank you for doing what you knew you ought to do when you knew you ought to do it. Yes, uh, it was, wow. I, I was thinking about it again, kind of raises the hair on my back a little bit. Mm -hmm. I could imagine. Um, because all of us, let me tell you something, I know everybody's listening to those voice notes was cheering you and those other people on. Like, we, we get to watch our first major sports game, right, after the pandemic. Um, I, and I know that people are proud of you, but I, I want to express the sentiment that this is what we expect, right? Like, we're not surprised. This is what we know our Bahamian men and Bahamians are, are into, Right. Like, this, this is just what we expect from y'all. Correct. I mean, this mm -hmm. has never been something that, that uh, uh, at least the men that I've grown up around, that is not, that's not the type of thing that we stand for. We've never stood for or condoned violence against women or children. That's, uh, we've always been old school in that regard. Mm -hmm. And, and um, that's one thing that I can say about at least most of the behaving men that I know. Absolutely. Um, do you... Can you identify any of the other bystanders that stepped in? Unfortunately, I don't. I don't have their names. I can. I can see their face right now, but mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know their names. Um, there was even the gentleman who allowed me to who kind of block traffic so I could do the illegal U-turn that I made. Yes. Sorry about that. Um, to the road traffic, but um. Uh, it, it was it was a concerted effort. I know my name is at the forefront, but those gentlemen who also stopped and got out of their car, 
there's also the senior mistress. At, I, I call the senior mistress mm -hmm. at, um, at Palmdale Primary, and she mobilized really quickly. She got, she was able to locate the, the young lady, and she, and I think they took the news up the chain to the director of education very fast. So things moved very quickly yesterday. The, the police officer, I called a personal friend who's an officer, mm -hmm. and he's the one who actually told me to stop chasing. Okay. And he, he told me to, you know, return to the school or secure the, the girl or yeah. something else, but don't, don't chase the, the perpetrator anymore. Yeah. So, but uh, the, he, he said he will contact Wolf Road Police Station, and they moved, I guess, immediately because they caught him. Maybe within an hour, they got him. Absolutely. So it was, things moved very fast yesterday. The system worked very well. Our system, our behavior system, did everything it was supposed to do yesterday. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I invited you because I, I personally, on my show, have been talking about women's issues, violence against women and girls in particular the whole month. And I know people, some people felt like I was running on, right? And sort of, you know, exaggerating. Um, but here are two perfect examples of, uh, you know, the violence that can and does occur yeah. and, and can occur if we don't continue to pay attention and that people are aware of the potential for this violence, but more importantly, know and understand their duty of care to other people and children despite the proximity, like despite of whether I know you or not. You still mind to take, you know? And I love right. that attitude about Bahamians. You still mind to take care of whether I born you or not. We still have a village mentality for the most part. Yes. And, you know, unfortunately, this, this, uh, it doesn't make the news very often. Um, you know, I, I was personally involved. This is the third situation in, in about six weeks I've been involved in. And the second one I'm directly involved in. Absolutely. Um, wow. And I, I, it's unfortunate. Uh, it doesn't make the news all the time. And, um, but we need to bring, and at least awareness is supposed to do something. We want to bring awareness, mm -hmm. but the awareness is supposed to create action. Right. So th that, that's, the re that's the first step. The first step is, of course, bringing awareness so that people are paying attention, they're looking out for it, and noticing the signs, they can recognize even the, behave, the behaviors in some children who, who are abused in various ways. They, they react in different ways um, at school or with their friends, or they may become introvert, or they may become violent at school. There are lots, there are lots of things that happen to these children as a result of what they experience. So we need to be able to recognize these kids and, and get them help as quickly and as early as possible. Right. And so one, one of the things I've been talking about is sort of spatial awareness and, and un, you know, understanding where you are in your community or, or, or environment. I'm thinking exactly. after, after what you've just said, particularly this being the third incident that you've been um, directly or indirectly involved in, maybe it's time for the business community in uh, businesses and communities where there are schools to partner with the schools, right, to create safe spaces. Like maybe the businesses support unemployed or underemployed parents to, mm -hmm. to do a community patrol, right? Um, mm -hmm. in, in Japan, the school routes are marked by color. And so children walk themselves to school, but the community members commit to, to providing like an oversight, right? Um, yeah. And maybe... You know, because what's most important here is that there are people who are willing to do it. You know, obviously you and those other men and those other people were prepared to do it, you know, to act when they saw it. So maybe we can build a program that creates a safe space around the schools to ensure that uh, or to reduce the risk that children have to interact with, you know, um, strangers, people they don't know, and in this particular instance, people who represent a danger to them. I, I agree with you. You, you really um, you hit a couple of point, good, great points there. Um, I think our school zones need to be taken a bit more seriously. I don't, I'm, I'm a little older than most, but I remember when we started to initiate proper uh, school zones with speed limits during certain times of day. We started that, I think, in the 90s at some point. Um, uh, you know, we were to drive, drive 15 miles an hour or 5 miles an hour within the space at mm -hmm. the start. But yep. like you said, also um, not to be uh, aware that, especially the primary schools, 
you know, the bigger school, the bigger children tend to walk in groups. Um, but we have a lot of primary school kids who walk to school by themselves. There's yes. quite a lot. So, yeah, like you said, um, and especially those that are in areas where we know that sometimes it can get dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, as far as uh, with, with police presence, like you said, we also need the community, the business community and the um, residents also to absolutely be involved. Absolutely. Yeah, and we can use existing infrastructure, businesses that have CCTV, right? Like we right. can, we, hopefully we can access that or create a program where it's not trying to access it after the fact. But eventually we have people monitoring communities through CCTV. Um, because these, these are precious, are precious, precious darlings, right? Like I don't have yeah. one myself because um, I send them home at the appropriate hour for their parents to take care of them. But, <laughs> You know, but how could we not? How could we not? Anyway, we, go on. These are, the, these are the children. You know, my mother, she, um, she started the National Children's Choir and the National Boys Choir. Mm -hmm. And her thing, with the, especially with the Boys Choir, she, she said that it used to make her sick that the, uh, that the bus with the young boys in it, the police bus, the prison bus, she used to drive past every morning. And she just got sick of it. And she said, she has to do something. Specifically, the young men. Mm -hmm. But she's always been a proponent. Her and, and her sister, uh, Audrey Wright, have always been a proponent of developing children and developing youth through music and through the arts. Mm -hmm. uh, my vehicle is, is through sports. Okay. But uh, I have the same passion. And um, I, I think that, um, not that we don't do anything, but I think we need just a little bit more focus on the, these programs that we already have in place or developing or expanding these programs that we have in place and really focus on developing our youth because there's, there's one component in all of this that no one is talking about mm -hmm. and that's the perpetrator. How does a 29-year-old kid, I mean, he's still, he's just out of kidness. Yeah. He, he, a few years ago, he was that kid walking to primary school with the lunchbox in the bag. That's a couple of years ago. It was yeah. So how did he go from that in such a short period of time to assaulting uh, a child on the street? How, how did that happen? Yeah. We, need to, we, we need to identify these, 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 um, these, these cases, see how they happen, um, because, you know, we're going to continue to produce uh, citizens like this. Right. Citizens like that. And, and so usu need, usually the trauma starts in childhood. The trauma starts in childhood, yeah. the trauma starts in the home most times, or around family members close by or very close by in the neighborhood. That's where the trauma starts. Yeah. So those programs that we kind of think are mushy and boring and, you oh, know. We, oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, I know those, what you mean. I grew up in yeah. one of them. You know what I mean. You know yeah. what I mean. You know, so, we, we have to return to a culture of appreciation for volunteerism and, and entrenching yeah. young people in that. Right, because it turns it turn, well, and we're going to get into this discussion in, in the show. But it turns out that when you're volunteering to helping to help others, you're also committing to helping yourself. It's like a trick that these wise Christian and old people is play on you. There's catch you. You didn't realize that you you ultimately are helping yourself. Yeah, I mean we're helping the nation. Yeah. In the long in the long run, it turns out we, we, these these people who we help, these people who we prevent from turning into that that villain. They turn into productive citizens, and productive citizens lead to a productive nation. Absolutely. So it, it, it absolutely, it's absolutely important that we that we, uh, we lend some focus towards these things. I appreciate the initiative that many of our leaders make, but I kind of feel like they're looking at the end, mm -hmm. but they need, they need to look a little closer to the beginning. Yeah. And um, you know, those the small projects, the one that don't get you a lot of news time, <laughs> those are the ones. Those are the ones that we need to focus on. Right, and, 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 cre and cause the most fundamental change. Absolutely. Dr. Bazard, let me let you get back to work. Just, yes, thank you. Just because I, I um gallivanting on the radio this morning don't mean you don't have responsibilities. But yeah, I still got, still got to work. Yeah, I, I, want every, I want to just say, everybody, please pray for both families. Pray for the, the, the victim's family and also pray for the young man's family because they have an issue to deal with as well. They've lost... We've lost a lot of young men, really. Yeah. So we need to pray for these families. And um, if, you, if you don't want to pray, whatever support you can lend, please lend. Absolutely. Support. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you for having me. 
And, and, and no, no, thank you for showing up. Thank you for showing up today. Thank you for showing up tomorrow. And thank you for the commitment you've obviously made to show up every day in your life and the life of others. You're welcome. Bahamas is welcome. Look here, like Rastaman say, King man, bless up. Bless up. <laughs> thank you so much, eh? Have a wonderful right. day. You too. Take care. Yes, sir. Okay, Bahamas. Um, I, got a, I see I got another caller on the line, Arlington. Um, Let's let them through. Caller, you on the clock. Good morning, good morning. Hey, good morning. How you doing? So I'm always doing well when your show is on. Thank I'm you. Better. Thank you. Aaron Green, you got a, a hero, my hero on your radio today, Bonkanita Bud, um, Salute, and uh, Banat. Mm-hmm. Banat, how you doing? Bazaar. Bagat? No, so his name was Do his name is Doctor Kent Bazard. Oh, Doctor Kent. But he was calling in. So he's no longer on the show. I had to get him to sort of not sneak out of work, but I had to get him to apply for a, a, a long break. Oh, wait a minute! If I understand you, the gentleman was who's on the news, not on your show right now. Not at this moment. He was. Oh. You were listening to him though. He called in from his place of work. Right. Right. Yeah. And your producer didn't answer. I did a my radio, you see. Ah. Uh, that's a problem, producer. should answer the phone. That's... If you have to load on it ready, then you're going to get a feedback. I know nobody's feedback. But anyway... Yeah. They, I, I, I salute him. And I, and I appreciate him. I, and, I, and I hear you talk about Aaron Green, a village. Yeah. You, you know, the village. The village Aaron Green is what I promote it now. It's called local government. Mm-hmm. I got that you. that area was a local government zone... The community would uh, would totally guide that area and make sure any people who wouldn't deserve or need to be helped mentally would get help. Right. So automatically, local local government structures give us greater agency in policing various areas in our course. communities, and not just traditional police work. Uh, no, but, but it, identifying it, it, and, and the people who need and providing the services yeah, they need for them. Let me break them. it down from a Pankanita perspective. It will be the Pankanita responsibility in my area and you, whoever lives in my area, to mm -hmm. set up a plan, a plan for disaster, a plan for mental, a plan for crime. But let's let's speak specifically to uh -huh. protecting young people and, yes. and, and and but no, in this conversation right now, let's speak specifically to the things that your local government would do to fill the gaps where necessary for young people in their communities. Oh, definitely to protect the young ladies, the children. Yeah, they they need to survive. They need to they need to be able to sing. Um, the song uh, by Whitney Houston, I Believe the Children. We yeah. must make sure they're able to sing that song and be safe in that song. Right. And, the, and, and, and let me tell you why what you say is so important. Mm. The little children need to be able to sing that song and understand it and trust that the people who, 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 who sh let them listen to the song mm. get it. That, even, that, that we are preparing a world where you as children can contribute mm. to your mm. own personal development and the creation of safe spaces for you. And of course, we need to check the migrant children. The mm. people that just go under the radar area, and I think you raised this a long time ago, it's always on my mind. Most people, uh, most children who are sexually molested from a punk and perspective and, and, and are migrant children. Now... That here's what we know that migrant children tend to be more vulnerable. More vulnerable, yeah. To molestation. So I use in 21 by yeah. seven words. No, no, you good. No, no, uh -huh. you good. Uh -huh. uh, but look here, I, I gotta go because I, I gotta get sure. to my two guests, but I wanna just make this point before you go. And before you make the point, yeah, that's how a show on it. Yeah, how you know. Yeah, I, I, I still try to get you two hours, you know. Don't listen. If, if it'll you... be on this station, it'll be on another station. But, but you still No, no, this. no, no. First of all, first uh -huh. of all, sir, we ain't married yet, so you can't make them kind of decisions for I me want you, on the air. I, I'm married Second. to your show. I'm I, we, we, I, 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 well, I, I received that. Two hours. I look at pumpkin eater. I received that, and I gotta go. We're just gonna say something for you. Yeah, go. yeah. I'm going to tell you now. Uh -huh. Um, in the paper today, there is a story. It is the Tribune on page five. The headline is Group Recognized for Human Trafficking Fight, right? right? And yesterday, I referenced a story in Monday's Guardian about a couple that was arrested and yeah, or charged yeah. with alleged sex trafficking yeah. um, charges, right? Right. Um, 
And I, you know, I, I had already had this story earmarked to talk about the, some of the very real dangers yeah. that are right in our face and we ignore entirely. Like yeah. we forget that the Bahamas is a transshipment point in exactly. the world. And one of the things that we are shipping is people yeah. illegally trafficking, yeah. for, smuggling, for, for, profit, for, profit. for profit, and young people. Uh. And children are most vulnerable to that. Ah. And so we, while we may be very easy to glide over and just forget that story or not to, to, to sort of take into, to understand how important this story on the human trafficking fight is, mm -hmm. the Bahamas is one of the prime spots for human trafficking and migrant children are the most vulnerable group of people who are being trafficked through our country. And it also important that when we, when, when we get to our resident record properly, could that everybody take up resident, a good resident. Right. And, and see, that's... I that with you. Well, that's a part of it, too. But let's, let, uh, me, let me make another point about the census, right? This uh, is why it's important to encourage people to participate in the sentence, census, whether they're documented or undocumented, right? Uh, this uh, exercise isn't a... A, a penalizing exercise. We not. This isn't about finding you and, and penalizing no. you for being here illegal. It's about knowing who is here, so we could know what we need to do to keep everybody safe. And I'm happy they're doing it online now. So, well, well um, the, everybody have a cell phone. So, the folks who don't here illegally have a cell phone. They could still yeah. uh, register a census. And, you yeah. Know. But listen, thank you, Pumpkin Eater. I got to go day. to a break, and then I'm going to get to this show. Arlington, can you take us out with that little with that little song? If, if it's ready. Anyway, you're listening to 96.9 FM. I'm so happy to have Dr. Bazard. We need to celebrate these things when they happen. So to, to remind these people we see them, and this is what we expect of all of us. And thank you for being a good role model. You're listening to 96.9 FM. We're going to go to a break, and when we come back, I'm going to dive into this conversation with my guests. We'll be right back. Come on. Hey, look, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. I said, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. If you feel me, say, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Again, I said, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Yeah, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Meet Jackie. Jackie's a hard worker with a steady income, but she has a personal loan and multiple credit cards to pay off. To keep her account current, Jackie opted for a loan from Fidelity Bank to consolidate her debt into one monthly payment and earn interest on a built-in savings account. Be like Jackie. Call 356-7764 to book a complimentary financial coaching session. Fidelity also offers virtual assistance. Fidelity, we're good for you. Always on the go? Miss the show? You can now listen to Guardian Radio talk shows anytime, anywhere on Spotify and YouTube by searching Guardian Radio 96.9 FM or by entering the name of your favorite show. You can also listen by logging on to GuardianTalkRadio.com and clicking on the podcast tab. Guardian Radio, continuing to provide you with fresh news and smart talk anywhere, anytime, all day. This is Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. Hey, look, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. I said, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. If you feel me, say, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine Again, I said let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Yeah Let it shine 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 Everybody say Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Talk to him, Lou. Let it shine 
Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, shine. Let it shine, let it shine, shine. Yeah. Talk to him, Dave. Good morning, Bahamas, and welcome back to 96.9 FM. You're on the clock with Erin Green, and we're streaming live audio and video on GuardianTalkRadio.com. You can listen on TV on Cable Bahamas Channel 969 or Flow Channel 612. Or you can download the Guardian Radio app for your Apple or Android smart devices and listen to our audio feed or watch us on our video feed right there on the Guardian Radio app. You can text us on the Guardian Radio text line at 422-GR96. That's 422-4796, and that's powered by BTC, standard text rate supply. Or you can call us at 323-6232, 325-4316, or 326-4259. Oh boy, this little light of mine. Look here. Good morning, Reverend Kelly. Good morning. Good morning, darling. So let's start right there, right? For me, I grew up in a culture of volunteerism, right? I grew up in the Methodist Summer Youth Program, um, where at first I was a, count, a camper, and then I was a counselor in training, and then I was a, camp, uh, a count, full counselor, right? And uh, my whole life has been um, about volunteerism and helping and doing your part. Um, some of it was formal, some of it was informal, you know, in the sense that really I didn't realize that I got shanghaied into a life of, of service, right, until I was in my mid-teens. And by then I loved it. Um, and Dr. Bazard talked about coming from a space where people appreciated the need to volunteer their time to build services, right? So Dr. Ke uh, uh, Reverend Kelly, tell us about your work with the church and tell us about the work uh, and the work that you're doing and the church is doing with young people. All right, good morning again, Aaron. Uh, good morning, Darwin, and morning. thanks for, for inviting me on this show. Um, it's a beautiful context we have this morning, beautiful start with Dr. Bazard on. And I think the church, the work of the church ties in really well um, with all of that. And I think the church in general is a space where we still have a really great sense of volunteerism. The church is supposed to act as uh, another family um, for, for anyone, and especially children that are usually uh, raised from, from birth um, in the church, in the context of the church. And so when we talk about youth work, um, I think of some of the, the programs that are going on right now in terms of the, the Methodist church that I'm involved in. I am assigned to a particular congregation, the Methodist Church of the Good Shepherd, but as a, a minister, an itinerant presbyter in the Nassau circuit, um, we all work together with all of the, the seven churches and we, we help with all of the youth work. And so in, in 2018, I came back home in 2017, um, I was called back home in distri district to serve. And at conference in 2018, we decided to develop a program called Space of Grace. And it was raised um, because of the need for, the perceived need for a space for young people from young children to, to um, the point of young adults to have a space where they can express themselves, um, a space where persons who, and again, this is a link with volunteerism and the society, mm -hmm. um, young professionals, young psychologists, young teachers, young artists, young poets mm -hmm. have volunteered themselves. And, and they, they may have not been associated with particularly the Methodist Church, but they have come in on a regular basis and, and sat down with our kids and had conversations with them or taught them something. And through that work, 
Um, it brings out different issues, things they are afraid of. Sometimes in the art you see and, and they talk about how they are afraid of the, the bullying that's going around, on around them in school. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you hear um, they are afraid about the, the situation between a mother and a stepfather in the, in the home. Sometimes you, you realize that the child is speaking about not having access to enough food, mm -hmm. um, things like that. And so the idea is to have that space where there is no, there's not supposed to be any judgment um, on the children, but it's a space where um, we use, the idea was to use poetry, writing, and the arts. But again, I said therapy came in to, to bring out um, not only the gifts of these um, children, but to bring out the issues um, that they may experience. And, and of course, we would also provide a hot meal. There's that. And of course, that's a program that, it, it, like I said, it's not based for one church, but it's, it's for children of any of the churches. In fact, any child in anywhere in the community mm -hmm. is welcome to, to come. Um, so that's just one of the, the programs. We also have our youth groups that are, that are supposed to be ongoing. Um, and I can speak later about another initiative that we took this year based on the, the conditions that the pandemic brought for the church. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when, we, when, when, I, when we say youth, children and youth, we usually think like from five, you know, five to mm -hmm. 18. Yeah. But we know that the, the, on the global stage, youth, uh, the, the upper limit of youth could be anywhere from 25 to 30, depending on the services mm -hmm. being provided, right? Um, or, or, or the space that we're in. So we don't, re but we don't really think about 18 year olds. Um, like 16 is the age of consent for in sexual intercourse. Mm -hmm. 18 is the age of majority, like when you could vote, right? And 17 is when you could drive, but we don't really think about, uh, and 18 is when you can drink. We don't really think about these people as, as young people, right? Mm -hmm. um, are there spaces being created? Like, are we, are we focused enough on creating age appropriate spaces for young people? So I'm 18, I wanna go and hang out, but I don't necessarily want to go to a bar, mm -hmm. right? I, I'm, I wanna go and hang out with my friends, I don't necessarily want to go to a church, right? But I don't want to go to a bar or a place where they're serving alcohol, or even as young men and young women, I may not want to go to a place where people feel it's appropriate to hit on or flirt with other people, right? Mm -hmm. Like, are we, are we recognizing the needs of this group? And how do we encourage businesses and investors to support spaces mm -hmm. that don't sell alcohol? Well, I, I, I see y'all looking at me, like I know what the answer is. <laughs> Right, but you know, I do what we what we do is we we show the, them the incentives, right, and we we talk about it particular and, and what you do is you go to an alcohol company, right, and then a company that sells alcohol, and you say, look, I, you got the money, I want you to sponsor this space, but I want your sponsorship to be all about how you sponsor spaces that will not sell alcohol as well, right, right? and we begin to shift the culture, uh, you know, around the coolness of alcohol consumption for young people. Um, but So I was a part of the Methodist summer program from the age of five to 18. It was integral in my life. Uh, and I think that um, residential programs and residential like immersion programs mm -hmm. are also effective for young people in terms of creating sp safe spaces. Because mm -hmm. um, you got them for five to seven days, right? And you control the content they have access to. And, and then you, like what we did at our summer camp is, we literally created, the, like the counselors created content, but we would create content with the campus yeah. and, and bring them into the process, right? So I, as a counselor, learn how to entertain people. And then we teach young kids how to entertain themselves. Mm -hmm. So the real the question is is the MCCA still engaging in summer and uh, programs and residential like camping programs? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. The pandemic last year has changed uh, a lot of what was regularly done, and we have to revamp some things. But normally there is um, there are two groups um, of camps. 
one children's camp for mm-hmm. a certain age group, and then there's youth gathering. You know, mm-hmm. you don't call it a camp, but it's still a sleepaway camp for the, the older children. And, of course, they are engaged. And what happens is that you have that group, 18 and older. And in the Methodist church, um, we tend to extend young youth, young adults, up to 35. And so what we do is we use those 18 and older for for the chaperones mm-hmm. for the camps along with along with us. So we are still trying to to do those efforts and as well as providing during the pandemic online uh, workshops mm-hmm. and encouraging. Um, there have been some persons from my congregations who are young adults who have been given the charge to lead those workshops. So they take their, um, what they think about worship, what they think about prayer, and they bring it to the congregation and they teach what they have learned um, during the pandemic. We've also had a program called um, Lockdown in Faith, not a program, but a competition. Okay. And so, and it was the young adults in particular that participated in this where they would send in videos uh, or TikToks or them singing a song that they wrote, something that, that says something about how you are coping in this space, in this pandemic, in this new reality, um, how you are using your faith to help propel you. What is your family doing? And so I think it's things like that that keep them um, not only grounded in their faith, but also engage with each other, and it empowers them to know that, hey, I'm a part of the work of this church. I'm a part of keeping this family together. And that's something that I'm really proud of. Another thing that, because we are the MCCA on a a Caribbean scale, Mm -hmm. every four years, the MCCA has a huge youth gathering called Youth Encuentro. And so this has been held in... Hold on, pause. And uh, Encuentro is Spanish for encounter. encounter. Could you just let me be fancy and bilingual for a moment? But go on, go on. Yes, so this has been held in in Barbados. This has been held in St. Kitts in Jamaica, in Antigua. Um, And uh, I chaperoned for the first time, because having gone to two of them as a young person, I chaperoned for the first time coming back home as a minister um in 2019 a group from with with young people from from the Bahamas from Nassau from Freeport from the Turks and Caicos uh 20 something of us went to Belize in mm-hmm. 2019 for youth in Quentro and this is youth around the Caribbean from all these different islands and, and places and all these different languages mm-hmm. come together for a whole week of seminars of discussions of modern, um, relevant topics and everything. And so, as I said, in 2023, the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos Islands Conference is now responsible for hosting that youth in Quencho. Look here, I'm going to start a tent business. <laughs> I'm going to start red and tents. How many people come? How many people do all expect? We are looking at 250 or more persons, and that's the, the bottom end of the scale. Listen, we don't have enough mosquitoes <laughs> to facilitate that many for us. <laughs> So that is something else, and, and our young adults who have participated in, in Cuentro are some of the most excited in helping to plan this for their friends that are coming from the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. So we're looking forward to that. It's, it's, it's about the church remaining engaged, not just for us to keep growing, but for us to keep pouring into the people who are in, in our society. Yeah, right? and, and young people in particular. Yeah. And if, if, ever you need, if ever you needed a motivator to pour into young people. We are getting old. Mm-hmm. Not these two in here with me, they're very young <laughs> right now, but I am getting old, right? And I, I need young people to, kn- to, to know that I reached out to them and I need them to reach back out to me, mm-hmm. especially when I old, old, old and don't rule, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so, cause some, uh, I, some of y'all are models for me, right? I'm looking up to some of y'all, three score and 10 gang, and y'all are models for me. And I, first of all, I plan not to rule. When my children say stay in the house, I ain't staying in the house. Mm-hmm. I going out the house. Yes. And I can need some young people to be able to recognize me, not as Erin Green, but just as, as a mom, right? Mm-hmm. And say, this could be somebody's mom. And even though she in this road carrying on bad, and she know what the rules are, and she <laughs> refused to follow them, I have a duty of care yes. to make sure that she get back home safe. But more importantly, I have a duty of care to the wider society to attempt to minimize the damage that this one bad haired lady could do in one day. Mm-hmm. Right? But and we want young people 
to know that as older people, we're going to need their support. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and, and that they are also going to transition. Mm -hmm. Right? And into, into being older. That was actually one of the initiatives that came out of our mission and evangelism committee uh, a, one of the years since I've been home. They, and this was, I believe, again, right before the pandemic hit, but they put out, uh, I guess, a resolution that in each congregation, because we have supposed to have visits to, to the, I don't want to call them the old folks home. But uh, what do you senior, call them? Senior residential care facilities. Senior residential senior care facilities, living. yes. And so in every congregation, groups should be made up of um, children and young people as far as are allowed within mm -hmm. those care facilities. So that is something that the Mission on Evangelism Committee recognized um, pretty early on and mandated that, you know, not only that, that they... They continue to care for the youth that are coming up, but that they themselves would care for the elderly in the mm -hmm. congregation as a part of a ministry of, of the church. Yeah, man, absolutely. I mean, and, and, and that's been tested, right? Where they, where they have some facilities where college students, like temporary living facilities, they live with older people in this uh, residential facility. And then they have programs where seniors come into kindergartens and preschools, and spend time, and act as, as, as teacher aides, and, and care mm -hmm. aides, right? And I, I, you know, when we were trying to decide what we were going to do with Bahama, if the people try to take their things back to China with them, and they realized they can't take it. I was thinking, look, one of the things we could put in here is an elder, uh, elder care facility, and, and daycare facility, and create a space where they can interact. But I realized there's a problem. If the little children and the old people get together, and conspire against us <laughs> yeah, yeah. is a problem. <laughs> it will, we will never win. Yeah, you can't have two extremes. You know, yeah. so, so Darwin, you are Bahamian and of Dominican, uh, you're from the Dominican Republic, right? Right, right. What's right. been your experience with youth programs um, in the Dominican Republic? Well, not, not much in the Dominican Republic. Uh, right. More so fam familial uh, programs have taken place. So my family will come together. Mm -hmm. And we'll go to the local Catholic church and spend some time with the congregation there. And, yeah. and, and all the children and all the, the elders would be together. So we'd walk from the church to home and, and host little um, gatherings. Yeah. My, my experience mostly uh, with, with things like that has been here in the Bahamas. Um, the, the Holy Trinity Anglican Church in Stapleton, I've always been a part of their youth, uh, youth mm -hmm. group uh, up until a few years ago. Um, and... In those experiences, I've gotten to hang with a host of older, younger, so many different types of people, mm -hmm. um, and and even taking part in camps and and sleeping in and all that stuff. It's super useful for for people like me, right? That need that guidance. That 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 may have, um, as we would say, anger issues. And, and yeah. issues controlling yeah, that anger. But, but see, you learn how to control that. Now you, you say <laughs> anger. Settings. You say people who may have anger issues, right? right. One of the things that inspired me to do this show is because I'm sitting here asking myself: Are we really taking seriously the issues that young people are having navigating the world before the pandemic? Exactly. But during the pandemic, are we at the state level? As a structured community, at a structured community level, right. at a familiar level, and as, at a personal level, right. are we taking our duty of care to young people seriously? seriously? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so one of the questions I wanted to throw out there was, um, and maybe from the perspective of the church, right, for, for people who are already engaged in programs, right. what do y'all need from us adults? Like, like us adults, we got to sit back and, and think about what are the ways in which we can moderate our own behavior, mm -hmm. right? And what are the ways in which we could shift our behavior? What do young people uh, in particular, and then people and groups running programs from young people, what do they need from us? And the first thing I could think about is this, is that as adults, we need to be willing to moderate ourselves, right. our personal expression right. in public spaces. Mm -hmm. And so, like, as an adult now, I love music. Mm -hmm. I, you know, let me tell you how much I love music. I picked that song to play this morning. Right, right. I got the head, you know, my producer let me know it's spot on. Um, yeah. I love music. And I even moderate the volume I play my music at in my own home, right? right? Because 
you, they, they, I don't think there's a child living right near me. But you may have your niece or your granddaughter exactly. over, and exactly. you may not. You may not ever have expected her to hear that word. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So I've taken it upon myself to moderate the the expression, the type of music I play, the volume I play it at in public spaces. Right. But what are some of the other behaviors that we as adults could very quickly and easily moderate um, to begin shifts? I'll, I'll give a few, uh, um, yeah. and then I'll allow the guests to speak. Um, my, in my, from my opinion, I think that adults should have an open-mindedness and, and a care to be careful about how you say what you say and what context you use to say what you say. So especially in a church setting, uh, we understand that, you know, Christianity doesn't necessarily support homosexuality. So you have a homosexual person in your uh, audience. Mm -hmm. Being careful about how you address that person uh, is one of the things that I feel is important. I'll go ahead and let Okay. You so I think that continuing the safe spaces that you expect to be provided within the church community Continuing that into your homes, I think a lot of times um, persons expect to, um, and depending on the context, but a lot of times you see children come into church, right. um, not brought to church. Right. Um, you expect the church to nurture this child to become this outstanding citizen, but are you continuing that that practice in your home? Not only that, are you providing the same safe space that we're expected to provide in your home? Mm -hmm. Are you, again, open to understanding your child and who they are becoming outside right. of who you expect them to be? And, or are you demanding of them things that they cannot um, possibly provide for you in terms of their generation? I saw, mm -hmm. I read something recently that said, you know, when I grow older, I just, I hope that I don't try and place the burden um, of, the kind of expectations of, of uh, applying my, my child living for the generation that I was raised in, right, but right. that I will propel them to be a great person in whatever context um, their generation provides for them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a great need in our society mm -hmm. where there are a lot of people around. Yes, the village is there, right. but sometimes the, the voice in the village is so great that you have to be this, right, or yeah. else, right? right. right. And um, I think sometimes that is what causes the downfall of a lot of the potentially pressure. brilliant yeah. Yeah. children, potentially very kind and empathetic children, um, quiet children who are pushed aside because they are expected to be charismatic leaders, mm -hmm. exactly. right? Exactly. Uh, children who uh, like to, to read and, and sit to themselves who are, I said there's something wrong with them because they're not... Um, uh, they're not the ones that uh, have a bunch of friends right, and right. Yeah. and all of this. Or we, we say, or yeah. we we're having an environment where we don't want our children to socialize or, mm -hmm. or have lots of friends mm -hmm. or think for themselves or say things we're not used to children saying. But we want them to be the child that uh, is seen and not heard. And we can't continue that that process. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, giving giving, uh, pulling ourselves back to allow children to be able to explore the fullness of themselves, yeah. right? right? right. Um, for me, it's also about understanding that young people have a degree of authority, yeah. right. that right. they have to learn how to acknowledge it, to, to manage it, to exercise it, but they mm -hmm. also have to learn how to do that in a larger environment where there are other types of authority, exactly. some that are at the same level of, as them and some that are higher than them, right? right. And I think we do a dis, our children a disservice the way that we allow power dynamics to play out in the house mm -hmm. because young people then never learn that I have authority and these other people have authority too. Right. And I think that's a part of the, why we have difficulty with conflict resolution, mm -hmm. right? Because we don't, I, we, we don't teach our children to see the divinity within other people because we don't teach them to see the divinity within yes. themselves, yes. right? Yeah. And yeah. what it means. Um, and, and, and so that's one of the things I think that we as adults can do to moderate, you know, in terms of moderating ourselves, reconsider mm -hmm. how we, how power structures our spaces and our, right. our family spaces and, and reconsider the amount of power, quote unquote, I need, right, to mm -hmm. feel whole. Mm -hmm and being able to shift the way that we operate 
power, you know, within power. Um, because some of these young men need to know, you know, they need to look at, be able to look at their fellow young man mm -hmm. and say, and really say, hey, I, king man, I see you. Right. I right. see you, king right. man. And he exactly. can look at him and I say, I see you too, king right. man. And, and the fact that we can accommodate the same space comfortably. We don't yeah. have yeah. to be at odds. We don't have to look at each other as, as, as taking up each other's right. space. Mm -hmm. because, yeah. because we have this very problematic thing where... Young people will tell you that they have been told, and it's obviously true, that you cannot be an adult right. until you move out of your parents' home. Because it can't be two adults in one home where only yeah. one person yeah. could rule, <laughs> right? But society doesn't work that way, right. even, right? And, 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 and in a way, we almost said, in, now, dear parents, look here, please, don't take what I'm saying today out on your children. <laughs> They had nothing to do with this. Nobody sent me a letter. Nobody write me and ask me to petition on their behalf. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking you to reconsider or right. to consider the way that the power dynamics work in your space mm -hmm. and whether you could, you could garner or maintain the same level of reverence and respect from your children, right. but by operating slightly differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we are almost out of time. Reverend Kelly, you run a program called Thursdays in Black Toward a World Without Rape or Violence and inspired me to put on all my, well, almost all, <laughs> most of my black clothes today. Tell us quickly about your program before we end okay. the show. Okay, thank you, Aaron. I don't run the program. Well, but you, you run the local <laughs> branch of the program. You no, know, I participate. Okay. So Thursdays in Black is a program initiated by the World Council of Churches, which is a uh, a body, uh, international body of which the Methodist Church and Caribbean members is a member church. And so I learned about Thursdays in Black as a seminary. And it's a way to start dialogue around the silence that can take place around rape and violence and, and gender-based violence. It's a way to break that silence. It's a way to, to, to protest, um, you know, because there are many ways to protest. And so the World Council of Churches, um, this started like in the, the late 1980s um, in, in a, as a reaction to a level of uh, femicide that mm -hmm. was happening. And so the Bahamas, the women, the Methodist women in the Bahamas have been a part of this for a long time, but this was relaunched recently, October 2019, the, the Methodist women. And I'm talking about the Methodist women combined and Wesleyan mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is not only a church-based program. So we encourage um, everyone, anyone, whoever you are, where you are, we all know people or some of us have been um, survivors of uh, sexual violence, of uh, abuse and, and stuff like that. You all know somebody. And so it's just a simple way to show your support, right. um, your solidarity with mm -hmm. persons who, who, who have been. And the church will definitely keep doing this. So every Thursday... We wear black. You, again, you don't have to be a part of a church or anything to wear your black, but we just encourage you to stand in solidarity with somebody out there who has experienced uh, violence. Absolutely. Thank you. What about yeah. this shirt? What about this shirt? Oh, yeah. yeah tell us about the shirt. And where right. can I get one? So this was a part of the, the launch. And okay. so um, you can just speak to me, and I can try and help you You get through our, through our women. All right. Okay. Yes. And we can find you online? Yes. Um, I'm Kelly Jolly on Facebook, K-E-L-L-I. J O L L Y, but I also have an Instagram page at Jolly Kel, J O L L Y K E L, is where I share encouraging, um, inspirational uh, sayings I write. And so find me there on Instagram. Absolutely. Arlington, I was going to ask you to play that song one more time as we head out. Um, and we're playing this song to honor all of those people who. Let their light shine every day. Amen. You know, and they're not worried about whether somebody going to see it or not, but they know somebody going to feel the warmth of that light when they let it shine. Uh, Reverend Kelly, Jolly, thank you so much for joining me today. My uh, guest co-host, Darwin, Miguel Thompson, thank you for joining me today. To Dr. Kent Bazard. Up, up, up. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for standing up. And to all of the people with you who let their light shine yesterday. Because all of them little children will never forget yeah. that light that you shone, you shine on them yesterday. You've been listening to On the Clock with Aaron Green. This is 96.9 FM. We've got Levan Miller and Unleash coming up next. Remember, Bahamas, let it shine, let it shine. 
Let it shine. Come on. Hey, look, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. I said, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. If you feel me, say, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Again, I said, let it shine.